Okay, let's get started. Today's uh, topic for discussion is a fine scaling method. And uh, the goal in a fine scaling method is to solve problems of this type. It's a linear programming problem. I want to minimize C transpose X such that AX is equal to B and X is greater than equal to zero. That's the problem I want to solve. X in RN. Okay. What I'm first going to do, take a detour. I'm not going to talk about the algorithm, but I'm going to talk about why any linear programming problem can be written in this form. So of course, if a linear programming problem is given in this form, then we can apply a fine scaling method directly. But we could have linear programming problem, which is minimize f transpose x such that ax or cx is less than or equal to d. No, I don't want to use x. I want to use y. f transpose y. c is already used. dx is equal to e. No, less than or equal to e. And x is in rn. Let's assume that, oh sorry, y is in, what's wrong? y is in rn. So this is the problem that's given to me. What I'm going to do is, through some uh, mathematical trickery, I'm going to transform this problem into a problem of this type. Just to illustrate that this is a standard linear programming problem and any problem in linear programming can be transformed into this particular problem. Okay. So let me do two things. First thing, I'm going to write y as y plus minus y minus, where y plus is max of y comma zero element wise and y minus is max of minus y comma zero. Okay, so I look at the element of y and if the element is positive, I keep the element same in y plus. If the element is negative or zero, I transform that element in y plus to be zero and I do the opposite in y minus. So if y is equal to one minus one, five, then y plus is one zero five, y minus is zero, one, zero. Okay, so everybody understands y plus and y minus. The other thing you should also notice is y plus is greater than or equal to zero and y minus is also greater than or equal to zero. Now, I'm going to rewrite this constraint as dy plus z is equal to e 
where z is greater than or equal to 0. Okay. So I add a non-negative vector to convert this inequality constraint into equality constraint. Okay. So now this problem can be written as I want to minimize F transpose Y plus minus Y minus such that D y plus minus y minus plus z is equal to e y plus is greater than or equal to 0 y minus is greater than or equal to 0 and z is greater than or equal to 0 Okay, so now this particular problem is exactly in this form. Let me do the one to one correspondence. So I have minimum of F transpose minus F transpose zero X. So X is Y plus Y minus Z D minus T an identity times x equals to e and my x is greater than or equal to 0. Yes, please. How does adding z turn the inequality into an equality? So dy is less than or equal to e. So if I add a positive number, I could make this dy plus z equals to e. So for every y, I can figure out a z such that this equality holds. So the z can be different for? That's right. For different y, z would be different. Any other question? This one? Right. So, so what I did was I made sure that I defined my x as y plus y minus and z uh, stacked as a vector. Now, if I redefine my, so I had f transpose y plus minus f transpose y minus, which is the same as this vector c transpose x. Okay. So, c here would be f minus f and 0. So that c transpose x is actually f transpose y plus minus f transpose y minus. So that gives me the uh, objective function and then in the constraint I have, let's look at the constraint. d minus d identity y plus y minus z is actually equal to dy plus minus dy minus plus z which is exactly this expression here. And so I have converted that inequality constraint problem into an equality constraint problem with x being non-negative. 
Okay, so this is a standard, this is a standard linear programming problem. And so no matter what kind of LP you have, you can always do some massaging of variables to get it in this particular form. Okay, any question? Okay. Now, for manifold suboptimization method, this way was okay. Like, if you want to solve a linear programming problem using manifold suboptimization, this form is completely okay. Because there the idea was to solve the inequality constraint problem. But for a fine scaling method, if you have to solve a LP, which is given in this form, but you want to apply a fine scaling method, not the manifold suboptimization method, then you have to get it in this particular form and then start applying the affine scaling method. So that's uh, just to go from LP, from a regular LP to a standard LP. Now let's focus on affine scaling method. So AX equal to B, X greater than equal to zero would look something like this sort of uh, uh, set will basically look something like this is my uh, three dimensional space. And it's basically going to look something like this. This is my space X, sorry, this is my uh, R3 and this is my set capital X. Basically looks something like this. <clears throat> now if I'm giving you this particular problem and I ask you to solve it using simplex method, then what you have to do is you have to be at the edge and you have to keep traveling along the edge until you hit the optimal point. Okay, so you will always be traveling along the edge. You will never actually go inside the set unless it is absolutely needed to go inside the set. The idea in a fine scaling method is, look, if I have to travel to this particular point from here, this is my X naught, this is my x star. If I have to travel from x naught to x star, I could either go along the edge or I could actually go from the interior of the set. So I could, I could literally just walk to the optimal point. So how do you do that? How do you come up with an algorithm that actually instead of going along the edge, it actually goes from the interior of the set and approaches x star in the limit? So that's the idea of a fine scaling method and that's what we are going to understand how to do that. Okay. So here is what we will try to do. Uh, I want to minimize, so I need to get X bar K. Remember in uh, the context of uh, con optimization over convex set, we need to get X bar K and then we need to get alpha K. These are the two things I need to specify. So let's look at X bar K. X bar K should be argument x in Rn, C transpose x minus xk plus
this is the form of gradient projection method and it's actually scaled by SK and HK. This is my set capital X. I'm standing at S XK and I'm going to compute X bar K on, uh, according to this particular uh, optimization problem. Have you seen this problem before? Have you solved this problem before or something very similar to this? Okay, so this is uh, your assignment three, problem one. So you actually, in assignment three, problem one, you're trying to solve a problem of this type, except for the fact that you didn't have this particular constraint in your assignment. But now we have this constraint. So what should we do? So you all know how to solve this problem without the constraint, right? All of you have, oh, I'm not sure whether you have tried assignment three problem one or not, but that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> I thought that you have submitted it, but then I realized that, okay, it's due date is next Friday. So uh, I guess if you haven't started, um, you know, I, I would highly encourage you to start solving the assignment now. So anyway, the assignment three problem one, you are asked to solve this problem without this constraint. But now in, in a fine scaling method, I have the problem, but I also have this constraint x greater than or equal to zero, and I want to get rid of it. I, I don't want that constraint to be there because I know without this constraint, I can solve it exactly. I can solve it by hand. So if you are faced with this issue, what will you do? Remember, always remember that in this case, SK and HK, you, it's in your hands how you want to pick it. Okay, so you can pick SK and HK according to whatever fashion you like. Any thoughts? Converting this to equality. To equality? Yeah, just what, like... No, but the question is not of equality. The question is, this problem is easy to solve. This problem is difficult to solve. So what should I do? So consider the following situation. I'm here, I'm standing at xk. What happens if I pick my sk to be a small number? If I pick sk to be a small number, hk is positive definite. sk is a very small number. Then what happens is your x bar k will be somewhere inside the set. And your x bar k will have all entries, which is strictly greater than zero. Okay, so uh, uh, let me retrace. So xk, I'm going to pick an xk which is strictly greater than zero and which lies within the constraint set ax equal to b. And I'm going to pick my sk sufficiently small so that my x bar k is also, uh, all the components of x bar k is strictly greater than zero. If I could do that, then I can totally remove this constraint because I know that the solution to this optimization problem without the constraint satisfies the constraint. Okay, so I can remove the constraint. Now this is a trick. This is actually a very neat trick. So you have a constraint optimization problem, but if you solve the unconstrained problem, 
you get a solution which is in the constraint set. So, okay, so here is the point. I want to solve a problem x greater than or equal to 0, okay. Now this problem is hard. So I solve a problem fx x in Rn. So I solve the unconstrained problem and I get x tilde star as the optimal solution and I get x star as the optimal solution here. And what I'm arguing or what is uh, something that you have to convince yourself of is if x tilde star is greater than or equal to 0, then x star is equal to x tilde star. fact. Okay, all of you convinced of this fact? So I solve the unconstrained problem and I notice that hey, it actually lies in the constraint set here. So then the optimal solution here must be equal to x tilde star. Yes, please. So, is it more generally if um, x tilde star just matches the constraint, or yeah. specifically for x tilde star? Yes. Okay. This is true, of course, more generally. Uh, so, you could have any constraint set, and you could have an unconstrained problem here, and if the solution to the unconstrained problem lies in the constraint set here, then you can you can just solve the unconstrained problem and not worry about the constraint set. You can always do that. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, having, having noticed this fact, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pick SK sufficiently small so that the optimal solution X bar K has positive entries. And because X bar K will have positive entries, uh, I can just remove the constraint and just solve this problem and make uh, and that would ensure that I satisfy the constraint x greater than or equal to 0 in this optimization problem. Okay, so does that make sense to everyone? So I'm going to remove the constraint x greater than or equal to 0 and I'm going to solve this problem with sufficiently small sk so that my x bar k is strictly positive. So let's try to apply assignment 3 problem 1 to solve this particular problem and identify the expression for x bar k. So I define lambda k to be equal to Okay. So if I remove the constraint x greater than or equal to 0, I can actually solve this problem exactly where lambda k doesn't depend on xk, but x bar k is xk minus sk, remember this sk appeared here, times some vector. 
okay? And so if xk is positive, so you will note that if xk is greater than 0, then no. If xk is greater than 0 and sk is small, then x bar k is also greater than 0. So that's the fun part here. I have a vector, it could be positive, it could have negative entries, I don't know. But my xk is strictly positive, so I can pick xk sufficiently small so that this whole term turns out to be a strictly positive vector. And then, all of you convinced that I can make sure that x bar k is strictly positive, then I can let x k plus 1 equals to x k minus plus alpha k x bar k minus x k which is equal to x k plus no minus alpha k s k h k inverse this is my iteration this is my affine scaling method Okay. Now alpha k sk term actually appears together, so I'm just going to pick only one parameter, alpha k. I'm going to combine sk and alpha k together, and I'm just going to put alpha k here. And I have found out what x bar k should look like, and this is the resulting iteration. Now all I need to figure out is what value of alpha k should I pick, right? That's the second part that I need to uh, determine. And so here is the way to pick alpha k. So let me define alpha bar k to be the max of alpha greater than zero such that xk minus alpha hk inverse c minus a transpose lambda k is greater than or equal to 0. And I'm going to pick alpha k to be uh, 0 0.9 alpha bar k or 0 0.99 alpha bar k. Okay. Does this make sense? So we have to figure out what alpha bar k is such that 
this term is still greater than or equal to 0 and then I'm just going to pick 0 0.9 times alpha bar k or 0 0.99 times alpha bar k as my step size and I'll plug it in here and then I get xk plus 1 and remember that xk plus 1 would be strictly positive vector. So all the elements of xk plus 1 would be a positive number. And so as you can see, uh, at every point of time you start with a positive vector and you end up with a positive vector and then you restart the entire iteration all over again. That's the way this affine scaling method works. And one important thing to note here is that your hk must change at every point of time. You can't pick hk to be identity because if you pick hk to be identity, lambda k becomes a constant and then you are not really changing this vector at all. And if you're not changing this vector, then you're literally just going in one direction because that's what it turns out to be. So, so that's why your hk has to change at every iteration so that you're converging to the optimal point and not just, not just going in one direction. So, so far we haven't discussed how to pick hk, okay? Uh, all we have said is, this is my x, x bar k minus xk, this is what it looks like and by picking alpha k according to this fashion, we should be able to converge. And the only caveat is my hk must change at every point of time. That's number one, number one observation. Number two observation is my, I start with a positive vector and I always end up with a positive vector throughout the iteration. Now the question is how do I pick my hk which is a positive definite matrix, how do I pick this particular matrix? So here is one idea. I am going to pick HK to be a diagonal matrix. 1 over xk1 square, 1 over xkn square, 0, 0. So this is the first element of xk, second element of xk, so, so on, and the nth element of xk, and you square it. So in short form, I can write it as where xk is diag xk. So I look at the vector, put it along the diagonal, create a diagonal matrix, capital xk, and then I take the inverse square of that, and that gives me hk. When I get this as my, uh, when I pick this as my HK, any questions so far on this, on this choice of HK? So if I pick my HK according to this, this is what my iteration turns out to be. Remember that this is a positive definite matrix because my xk has positive entries. So then xk plus 1 equals to xk minus alpha k xk square c minus a transpose lambda k 
and lambda k is given by Yes, please. Um, is it a 2 or a minus 2? Uh, there is a 2 because it's hk inverse everywhere. Uh, so because I picked hk to be xk minus 2, it's all 2 there. And this is known as affine scaling method. Affine scaling method. And this was discovered in 1967. Okay, so a fine scaling method picks a very specific choice of HK, which changes with every iteration automatically. And your alpha k of course is picked according to the way I had mentioned before and, and this method was invented back in 1967 um, and is a very, very reasonable algorithm. It has a good convergence speed in practical problems. Any question so far? <clears throat> okay. So this algorithm differs from the manifold suboptimization method in a fundamental way. In a manifold suboptimization method, the idea was I'm always going to be at the edge and then I should go, I will converge to the optimal point by just being on the edge and whenever it requires I will go inside the set. One thing that I forgot to mention is when you have a linear programming problem the optimal solution is always at a vertex. So if you are just going along the edge you will always reach the vertex at which the optimal point. Um, uh, so if you are going along the edges you can reach the optimal point without going inside the set. But in the affine scaling method, the idea is I'm not going to go along the edge because I've, I will take, I don't know, like many, like if, if you look at this room, it's a three dimensional room and it has a total of eight surfaces, right? So four walls, no, six surfaces, four walls, the floor and the ceiling. So it has like six surfaces. But if you look at the number of edges, I don't know how many edges we have, like four edges in the top, four on the side, and four in the bottom. So we have about 12 edges. So in three dimensional room, we have 12 edges, right? And, and so if you are traveling along the edge, then you might take a lot of number of steps before you actually reach the optimal solution. So that was manifold suboptimization method. A fine scaling says, hey, look, if I'm taking so many edges, I'll take so many, so many steps to get to the optimal solution. Let me not go along the edge, let me just go through the interior of the set and reach the optimal point through the interior. So I can, if, if that vertex is the optimal point, I could literally walk through the class, through the set, constraint set, and I can reach that particular point. So I don't really have to go along the edges. So that's what a fine scaling method, the key idea in a fine scaling method is, remember simplex or manifold suboptimization was discovered in 1940s or invented in 1940s and this was invented in 1967. So for about 20, 25 years, that was the only method for solving linear programming problem. And the idea there was to go along the edges. And this was the first algorithm that said, look, I don't want to go along the edges, I just want to go into the interior of the set and I will converge much faster. So that's the difference between the manifolds of optimization method and the affine scaling method.
okay? And this choice of xk is actually very cool because what it does is, so if you are looking at the constraint set, remember this is, this would be x1 equal to 0, this would be x2 equal to 0, this would be x3 equal to 0. So, if you are starting at xk, oh, I wrote x1 equal to 0. So, this is the first component of x equal to 0, this is the second component of x equal to 0, this is the third component of x equal to 0. Now, I am looking at the iteration xk and I am going to converge to the optimal solution and as soon as I get close to the boundary, this xk square becomes very, very small, okay, because not xk square, but one of the components of xk square becomes very small and that allows me to move away from the boundary. So it, basically the choice of hk is allowing you to move away from the boundary as soon as you get closer to the boundary. Um, so that's one part and then of course you pick alpha k according to certain fashion which allows you to converge to the optimal solution uh, if this is what your optimal solution is. If HK doesn't change every time, yeah. yes. It's, gonna, it's not going to move away. Yeah, it's not going to move away. In fact, the direction, lambda K will be a constant because if HK is identity or, or, or HK equals to H, and this is H inverse, this is H inverse, and this, these are all constant. So this is going to be a constant. Lambda K will be a constant. And if lambda K is constant, then this is constant. And then this is HK inverse. So this is constant. So you are basically never changing the direction of descent if you pick a constant hk. So that's why you have to change xk at every min, at every iteration so that you are not descending in the same direction. And this choice of hk, which is xk minus two, that allows you to move away from the boundary and remain within the set and approach the optimal point through the set, okay? Any other question? We will study in a few classes later, we will study another um, algorithm of this type where you try to approach the optimal solution through through the interior of the set and that is known as barrier method and we will we will study the properties of that particular algorithm when we get to it so that algorithm has the best convergence property in the worst case situation now of course in day to day life you may not be solving the worst case uh, linear programming problem but that has a very good that has but you know, from a computational complexity viewpoint, that algorithm has very nice uh, and desirable properties of converging in cubic, almost cubic time step. Okay. So that ends the discussion on optimization over convex set. We have studied so far uh, conditional gradient method, gradient projection method, and then two uh, specific uh, types of gradient projection method. One is the manifold suboptimization method where we said, hey, look, projecting the gradient onto this very large convex set is very complicated. So I'm just going to restrict myself to the set of active constraints at every point of time. And then the second algorithm is a fine scaling method where we say that instead of going along the edges, 
I am going to go through the interior of the set and converge to the optimal point. And of course, affine scaling is only defined for linear programming problems. Now, the next topic that we want to talk about is uh, KKD theorem or Lagrange multiplier theorem and KKD theorem. So, that's the next topic. And this is uh, not algorithmic in nature, it's basically some theory about Lagrange multipliers. And uh, once we understand that theory, then we will start devising new algorithms for constraint optimization problems. So, let me. Uh, what time the class ends? I think 2.45, so I have 10 minutes. So let me tell you what setting we have in the Lagrange multiplier theory. So now, I have the following problem. I want to minimize a function such that hx is equal to 0. My function f maps rn to r, and my function h maps rn to rm. I can equivalently write it as h1x equal to 0 and hmx equal to 0. Let's look at a picture of what this means. So I have a bunch of equality constraints. These are known as equality constraints. So I have a bunch of equality constraints and I want to minimize the function where all the equality constraints are met. So let's consider this function. This is a nonlinear function and this is my h1 of x equals to 0. So it looks like a curved surface in the space because it's a nonlinear function. If it was a linear function it would be a it would be a hyperplane but because it's a nonlinear function it now looks like a curved space curved surface in the space. And I have h2 of x equal to 0. That looks like this space. <clears throat> okay, so I have two curved surfaces and I'm interested in knowing where the two surfaces intersect, okay, where both surfaces have are equal to 0 or h1 and h2 of x both of them are equal to 0 and that's this line that's this line so that's where these two surfaces are intersecting and at this point h of x is equal to 0 And it's basically a, a curved line, a curved, uh, it's, it's not a, a, a line, a straight line, it's actually a curved line. And we want to minimize the function, we want to minimize this function over this curved line. That's our goal.
So the question is, what's the necessary condition for optimality for a point x star to be optimal? So I have x star here. I'm going to claim that this point is optimal. What's the necessary condition for optimality? What is it that this point, what are the conditions that this point must satisfy for it to be a minimum, uh, minimum uh, minimizing solution to this problem? So this is answered through what is known as Lagrange multiplier theorem. So let's try to understand what that theorem says. I should erase this. So I have to define something. So x is a regular point if gradient of h1 of x gradient of hm of x are linearly independent vectors. Okay, so let's pick any point on this surface, uh, I mean on this line, curved line, so this is my x. Can someone tell me what is gradient of h1 of x? What direct, which direction does it point to? Normal to the surface? Yeah. So gradient of h1 of x will be normal to the surface. So this is my gradient of h1 of x. Gradient of h2 of x would be normal to the surface. Are the two vectors linearly independent? Yes, they are linearly independent. So therefore, this point x is regular. So I look at the outward normal or the gradient of the function and in this case they are linearly independent vectors. Okay, let's see, uh, consider a situation where they are not linearly independent. So I have two circles this is my h1 of x equal to 0, this is my h2 of x equal to 0. They intersect at exactly one point, okay? There is only one point where both of them are 0 and that's this point. And what is the normal to the surface? So normal to h1 of x and normal to h2 of x, both of them are pointing in the same direction. Are they linearly independent? No, they are not. They are not linearly independent. So this point is not a regular point. Okay, so in order to understand Lagrange multiplier theory, we need to understand what it means for a point to be a regular point which we have understood through some illustrative examples. In the next class, I'm going to talk about Lagrange multiplier theorem, which talks about a necessary condition for optimality for optimization problems of this type. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>